Hello uh, to everybody. Uh, welcome to this roundtable, which is going to take place in English, of course, because we have the pleasure to have uh, renowned and uh, uh, scientific women from uh, Arab countries with us uh, this morning. So I'm Alexandra Palda. I'm the head of the L'Oreal Foundation and leading um, the program for women in science. So for women in science is a, is a, a little bit different than women for science because uh, the women we choose are working for science, but we choose them to promote uh, women scientists all around the world. So L'Oreal, uh, the L'Oreal Foundation for the last 20 years uh, has tried to promote, contribute to make a uh, incredible women scientists around the world visible, uh, to give them the floor, um, to make them visible in public, give them the opportunity to be role models, um, because we think that uh, the world needs science and science needs women. Um, we know that uh, science is better when we have all talents uh, um, available, involved, and that we also need uh, uh, the perspective of everybody in order to have inclusive science and then inclusive uh, uh, societies. So this is what we do at the L'Oreal Foundation for the twenty for the last twenty years. We select excellent, outstanding women scientists, give uh, fellowships, international prizes, and today we have the honor and the pleasure to have two of them with us. So I would like to introduce our speakers and guests uh, today. Uh, let me start with uh, Madame uh, Najat Aoun Saliba. Um, so uh, Najat has been our 2019 uh, L'Oreal UNESCO International Award for Women in Science for the Africa Arab States region. Uh, you are a professor in chemistry at the American University of Beirut. You are researching air pollution and climate change, uh, and you're working on important projects that involve civil society, community-led and community-driven answers um, and environmental projects to find the most suited solution to these local challenges that result from climate change. Um, you have also been director and founder of the Environment Academy, and um, additionally to the UNESCO uh, L'Oreal UNESCO International Award. You have also received the National Order of the SIDA from the President of the Lebanese Republic. You are, um, uh, and you have also been voted in 2019 to be among the top 100 most influential women by BBC. Our second uh, speaker is Dr. Arej Abu Hamad. Um, Dr. Arej Abu Hamad has also been um, um, involved in the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science program. She has been, in 2017, received the Fellowship for Women in Science. And in 2018, you have been our international rising talent. International rising talents are the most talented young women selected every year. You are, um, you are, um, you have studied pharmaceutical science, uh, uh, first in Jordan, and then you have uh, been in, Ox in Oxford University at the Department of Pharmacology. Um, you have received prestigious research funding from national and international bodies to carry out protein crystallography experiments. And you're also the founder and principal investigator of the first protein crystallography laboratory in Jordan. Um, you, are, uh, um, you are very involved in finding, uh, in transferring advanced technology used in structural biology to Jordan and the region to enhance scientific collaboration in this field. Um, and um, we have also with us, so we have the pleasure to have with us Elias Yuini. Uh, you have a very um, uh, a prestigious career uh, behind you, working in the public sphere. You have been minister in uh, Tunisia, but you have, or you're a scientific, you have a scientific training yourself. You're a professor in mathematics and economy. 
um, at Paris Dauphine. You uh, started um, um, the chair, uh, a research chair, uh, UNESCO Women and Science, uh, which we support happily uh, with other companies. Uh, um, and uh, well, you have a, a, a incredible intellectual, scientific, and uh, public career behind you, specialized and interested by your career, I think, in the, in the issue of women and science. So when we look today at the issue of women and science, so in women and science, uh, we have 33%, 33.3% um, of all researchers in the world are women. Uh, that are the numbers of 2018 from the UNESCO report. Um, they are 42.6 uh, in the Arab states, so more than in the on the world average. Uh, there are some Arab states who have an impressive progress. When we look into Algeria, they have been, had been at around 35% in 2005, and they are 47% in 2017. In Egypt, we go from 36% in 2007 to 46% in 2018. So we see that there is a loss of progress, stronger than in other parts of the world. So Elias, uh, tell us a little bit as you're piloting a lot of research projects on this issue. Can you share a little bit your analysis on this? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra. And uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to participate to this uh, roundtable. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, le let me give some, some figures. There are seven countries in the world for which the proportion of women among science, technology, engineering, and mathematics graduates is higher than 50%. And among these seven countries, there are four Arab countries, uh, namely Algeria that you already mentioned, Tunisia, Oman, and Syria. And if we add Sudan, Morocco, Palestine, Bahrain, and the Emirates, we have nine Arab countries in the top 20. If instead of the gender gap in choice, we focus on the gender gap in performance on the basis of PISA and team scores, Friar and Levitt claim that surprisingly, although Middle Eastern countries have a high degree of gender inequality, there is no gender gap in mathematics on average in these places. Do I have to remind the one and only woman that obtained the Fields Medal, the highest distinction in mathematics, is from Iran, not an Arab country, but a country with a very close cultural background. She studied in a four-girls-only high school before to obtain her bachelor in Tehran. There are mainly two explanations for the gender gap in choice. First, math has a stronger instrumental value in countries with more economic and or more social constraints. Girls need more to study in general and more particularly in scientific fields to have good career prospects and guarantee as far as possible their freedom, their emancipation, and their material security. It is somehow a way for them to overcome the male primacy ideology or even to leave the country in some cases. Second, in these countries, men aspire less to scientific careers and to careers in higher education and research. Therefore, there is no social mechanism for the monopolization of these careers by men in this country. And as far as the gender gap in performance is concerned, and as we, as we have seen with Thomas Breda and Clotilde Knapp in a recent paper in Science, the main determinant across countries is not the degree of gender inequality, but the degree of social inequalities in general. The more a country is inequal, the more the gender gap is pronounced. And countries where girls perform less in science are those where low socioeconomic background students perform less and those where the gender inequalities are higher. Thank you very much, Elias. Perhaps I would like to go back to one point and direct the question to you, uh, Arej. Uh, is, it, is it part of getting a space of freedom and expressing yourself? Is science a better way um, to do this? Do, does this reflect your experience? 
Uh, hello, Alexandra. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here and for inviting me. I uh, totally agree with uh, Elias in what he suggested. I think that's very true. Uh, women seek freedom when they uh, when they study. And uh, I will give example from my country here in Jordan. Uh, I see a lot of uh, females and even families, they are more interested in getting their girls and uh, daughters get educated. Uh, for me, I also uh, I, I came from a family where my, my mother was forced to leave school when she was young, and she grew up determined and very uh, committed to give us uh, her daughters and even her uh, sons the best possible education. And she was an inspiration for me through my uh, education uh, stage. And I remember she was buying me uh, and my father, she, they were buying me those um, Lady Bird books about science and chemistry and electricity. And I grew up fascinated with the uh, with science and with the ability of some people to create things out of nothing. So the inventions and all these. And uh, when I arrived to high school, I wasn't sure what to study because I was in love, in love with mathematics, uh, physics, uh, biochemistry, and also biology. Uh, until one of my uh, family friends suggested that maybe you should consider pharmacy. And that was uh, uh, sort of a, a new field for me. I've never heard about it uh, initially. And I wasn't sure if I would like it, to be honest. In the first two years, I didn't like it very much because... Um, I, I thought that the only job that I can do is just to be a community pharmacist. And inside me, I believe that uh, people who, who need medications should receive it without having to pay for it. Uh, so, you know, when you are young, you have all these um, uh, dreams. And uh, in my third year, I, I started to see my uh, uh, supervisor, uh, my professors at the university who were females, uh, who has a doctorate and who are university professors. So I started to see a newer possibilities for my career. And uh, that it was at that time that I decided I want to be uh, in a career in, in, uh, in, uh, to get a doctorate and to be a university professor. And that's sort of, for me, I, I still believe it's sort of celebrating experience. Uh, my journey wasn't very easy. Uh, because uh, at my time, uh, there was no university in Jordan that would offer a PhD in pharmacy. So the only possibility was to go and study abroad. And for my parent, it was, uh, you know, it was also not very exciting news. Uh, they didn't approve. They were scared of the unknown. Uh, they told me, uh, we can't join you there. We, we can't afford to go with you. And, uh, you know, we can't uh, just let you go to those people. We don't know much about these cultures and, you know, they are different. And, you know, it's, I think it was the fear of the unknown. Uh, and uh, I was lucky because I think I just have uh, my, my three keys. I saw, uh, I called them my three P keys, uh, patient, passion, and persistent. Uh, I couldn't take no for an answer. And the only liberating um, uh, idea was is to just pursue my my studies and uh, continue to, uh, you know, just stick to the scientific field. Uh, I did master's in Jordan, uh, and I managed to publish two papers of my uh, master. Uh, I communicated with universities, and that was after eight years after finishing my degree. And uh, at this stage, I thought, uh, if I want to go and study PhD, I have to go to one of the top universities in the world. So I got two acceptance letters, one from Oxford and one from Cambridge. And I went to my parents and I told them, listen, I can't just give up. <laughs> I have two acceptance letters from these two universities and I really want to go um, to one of them. And I think at this stage, they just flipped. Um, they realized how passionate I was about my uh, my dream. And it was absolutely the most fascinating experience to me when I set my, uh, my foot first time when I crossed the doors of the Department of Pharmacology and University College uh, in Oxford. It's like it was like magic. Uh, it, it was rich in, in all aspects, science, uh, people, history cultures and I didn't feel anything but being welcomed and uh, understood and people were curious to learn more about my culture. So I felt included uh, and that was fascinating and very, very liberating for me. So to be honest, I'm Thank you very much.
Arash, Arash, we have some connection. From... We we they couldn't hear you. Yeah, we couldn't hear you just the last uh, the last phrase. But we had we have gained the sense of uh, uh, what you have uh, how 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 you were um, uh, perseverant. And I love your three P keys: um, passion, uh, patience, and uh, perseverance or persistence. So uh, I do think that all signs we. more when you you have to wait eight years to to follow up your dreams and to, to pursue your your studies uh, so uh we, we can imagine a little bit the uh the the level of engagement and commitment from your side Imagine is that also um is that also something that you have experienced Thank you, Alexandra, for this opportunity. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with uh, my colleague, Dr. Arij. But let me let me start in the reverse order. I would like to tell you uh, the recent uh, achievements and then go back and and talk about my childhood and how I had to break some glass ceilings to get where I am today. Uh, starting with a few weeks ago, I was chosen by a political among the top 12 women in the world for feminist action for climate justice and among the top 100 women on gender policy. In 2019, and right after receiving the L'Oreal UNESCO International Award for Women in Science, I was chosen among the top 100 most influential women in the world by BBC. My students this year wanted to nominate me for the Best Teacher Award, and I quote one of my students. When I asked to pinpoint to an impactful role model as I near my graduation day, I would undoubtedly credit Dr. Najat Saliba. A matriarch for women in STEM, Dr. Saliba embodies the impactful qualities of a sharp researcher, coveted both nationally and internationally, and the compassion of an educator who brings life to education. She has opened numerous alleyways for students, both at AUB and across the country, to look at education as an impactful tool to make practical change in our ecosystem and our country. Dr. Saliba's staunch perseverance has taught me not to take no for an answer and to stay curious of my surroundings which has driven me to assert my place in my STEM field. There is so much to learn from someone who continues to gracefully push the boundaries of science, innovation and reforms of impactful and applied education. What Dr. Saliba builds is not a classroom, but a community of scientists and engineers who care to make an impactful change, end of quote. The worldwide recognition for my passion to my work with a huge responsibility towards women and girls in the Arab and North African regions. Our region is in great need for role models in science the young girls need to aspire to. In recent report on women inclusive policies and practices in organizations in 11 different countries that was produced by AUB, it was found that there is a prevalence absence of women in leadership positions in STEM. In fact, and according to the study, STEM ranks the lowest of all six sectors of financial, education, healthcare, STEM, professional, and other services. Yes, the world needs science. Our region needs science more, and the science needs women. The best confirmation to the great need of science is the world in the world today is the recent pandemic. We realize that without science, we cannot win the battle against SARS-CoV-2. From our understanding to the disease transmission, airborne or not, to developing the vaccine, storing it and administering it, we needed scientific research done by scientists in research labs. So what is it that we can do in order to increase the representation of women in STEM in our region? Girls must be exposed to science at an early age. The preparation of scientists to the workforce must be done in a continuum. 
starting from schools and extending all the way to their professional career. Having grown up during the civil war in Lebanon, education was not a priority for survival. My family's focus was elsewhere. And so my fight to graduate from college was accompanied by many tragic moments. And then later, returning back to Lebanon after completing my higher education in the US, I also had to face an uphill battle to establish my research lab. Living in a country that never considered research and science a priority, there was no infrastructure for scientific research, no resources, and no funding. And yet, I am where I am today. Moving forward, I say that we must break many cycles of traditions, stereotypes, corruption, and ignorance. Let's establish science labs in schools, universities, and the work field so that women can strive in STEM. It is our responsibility collectively to take a constructive action to narrow the gender gap in all sectors and most importantly in STEM. We need to support building research lab. We need to abide by scientific recommendations so that bright girls see it and believe it. The world definitely needs science. Let's create the space for the science to be shared and led by women. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nasha. That was uh, quite a, a plaidoyer uh, for, 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 for women in science and a lot of, uh, of different measures. Uh, we will perhaps have uh, a little bit of opportunity to get back. So, but, uh, what I wanted to say is, well, we have a lot of women more and more, uh, women who uh, study, who uh, start a career, but still very few women who take it to the top, because even if we have uh, a better representation at uh, the basic level, when we look at the highest level, we, we have a glass ceiling like everywhere else in the world. Elias, we have just five minutes left, and I would like to give um, back the floor to Arish a little bit. But can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is your experience uh, about glass ceiling? Uh, on the one hand, a direct consequence of uh, what I said earlier is that science is not a real priority in Arab countries. Being an academic is somehow seen as being a teacher and having more time for the family, for the kids, etc. It is more or less seen as a woman activity and the competition is weaker and the field does not obtain the support it deserves. And this generates a vicious circle. And on the other hand, there are two dimensions, uh, sociologists know that there are two dimensions of gender ideology, gender essentialism and my male primacy. The first representing men and women as fundamentally different, but not necessarily unequal, and the second representing men as hierarchically superior. In a gender essentialist world, the segregation is horizontal, some fields are for men and others are for women. In a male primacy world, the segregation is vertical. In any field, the highest positions are for males. Any country is in fact a given mixture of, of these two worlds. But in Arab countries, we have a high proportion of women in science, but this should not hide, this should not hide that there is a strong vertical segregation, even in scientific fields. Full professors, rectors, heads of research laboratories, are mostly men, and then even if we have many women, lots remain to be done in order to have really an equal uh, uh, system uh, in the scientific world in this country. Yeah, and that's not just in the Arab world. And the glass ceiling in science is persisting and perseverating everywhere on the world, even as somebody in the audience uh, put out in northern countries, in northern European countries, where the economic and political gender gaps are low, you are right. But what we also know is that the, the, the obstacles and the, the challenges to go into science, this is not just, uh, it is not just gender uh, stereotypes and uh, gender discrimination. It is also a, a, a culture in science and in university careers that does not always encourage women to go into this field. Um, 
Arrange, uh, when we prepared this round table, we said um, um, how um, how do we see the future in uh, how do we see the future of women in science in Arab countries? And I would like to ask you, everybody, because we have just three minutes left, to answer in one minute to this question. Arrange, uh, Najat, and Elias, how? How do you see, we start with Arej, then Elias, and we finish with Najat. How do you see the the future of women in science in Arab countries? Uh, I'm very optimistic, Alexandra. I think there is a huge potential. We have a huge potential in the brains and minds and the ability of women uh, to do different things and to do things differently. And also, uh, I think what we need is more support. And I see it in two ways. It's just enhancing the, the, the picture of role models. And here I have to acknowledge the Loria of UNESCO because it was really great uh, opportunity for exposure and also for highlighting the research of different females. Uh, it's good for females to see um, pictures of themselves in the others. Uh, and also the other thing I think what, we, what I hope to see uh, maybe it's not uh, optimal, is to see more women in higher education and to facilitate the higher education for them. Unfortunately, we have very limited positions for higher education. And uh, I will give examples from my country in Jordan. In my school, 10 places every four years are available for PhD students. So I think there is a potential um, to enhance the interest of females, because I believe writing a PhD thesis, it's like a passport, not only for career in science or in academia, but also for self-confidence. And I think this is what we have um, to focus Working. on, how to grow confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tarish. Elias, wow, how do you see the future? I fully agree with with, with uh, Dr. Arish. I'm uh, quite optimistic uh, because uh, there are more and more women in higher education in Arab countries and more and more women in science and believe in role models. And these women, and in particular those that uh, participate with us in this round table, are role models for the next generation. Then the, the, uh, we are in, in the, the, the direction is positive, but we have to uh, do more uh, in order to uh, put ahead the 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 the, um, the women that succeed, uh, in order to uh, give to provide more advice to to, to young women to uh, to girls, in order to to, to let them exploit their their um, their, their talents, uh, and um, then many things remain to be done. But I'm uh, as I said quite optimistic. Najad, let's finish with you. What What is your perception, in one minute, please, about um, women scientists in the Arab world in the future? We have very enthusiastic young girls. They just need the, the space for them to excel. Uh, we have a long way to go, but we need to create the space for research and for science to strive. That's a wonderful last phrase, uh, reflecting the world needs science and science needs women. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for your participation. I'm sorry that we do not have more time, uh, neither for to listen over to you, neither for questions from the audience. But um, um, we have a lot of uh, available um, documents, research studies of the uh, incredible um uh, Films about your careers at bien sûr de l'université du Finn, le cher uh, femme et science, and also at the, the L'Oréal Foundation. So, the, for those who are interested, please don't hesitate uh, to look up. Uh, and thank you very much, Nashad, Arange, and uh, Elias, for your time and your participation. Uh, and there is now a lunch break, and you will have the, the conference starts again at 2 p.m. Uh, so. Um, uh, uh, of course, you're expected, the audience, um, we would be happy to see you again at two. Goodbye. Hi, thank you. Goodbye, thank you very much.